Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Intelligently Fueling Your Processes with Capture. I'm Teresa Resick, the Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are David Janess of IBM and Richard Medina of DocuLabs. And IBM is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. Before we get started, just want to offer a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. By joining our webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience, so feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows that you have available to you on your screen. And across the bottom of your screen are a list of all of the widgets that we have for you today. Group chat is available to you, and you open this by clicking on the widget in, in that list of icons at the bottom. Uh, and with the group chat, you'll be able to, to talk with each other and also, but be aware everyone will be able to see everything, but you can chat with each other and also chat with us here at AIM because we'll be joining the conversation with you as well. Do ask questions um, of the speakers throughout the hour using the Q&A feature, and that's to the left side of the slide area. We will hold these questions until the end where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them. You can also use this feature to ask for technical assistance. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list, and that's to the right of the slide area. And there's also a few other documents and links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. So click in there at any time. The resources will open in a new browser tab for you, and you can save it or read them after the webinar today. At the end of this webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser, and it's the same survey that's open at the bottom of your screen right now. We would appreciate if you would take a few moments to offer your feedback, suggest other topics for us to cover, and I would thank you for your time to do that. Uh, and also this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to AIM.org's resources webinars page in just a few days. I want to introduce the speakers we have with us today. Very pleased to have both these gentlemen with us. And no, I did not shave my head in honor of our two speakers that are here with us. <laughs> thank you for that suggestion though, David. Um, but Richard Medina is the co-founder and principal consultant at DocuLabs, and he has consulted for organizations in a wide range of industries, including financial services, insurance, communications, utilities, and government. DocuLabs was founded on three pr simple principles, objective recommendations, analysis grounded by benchmark data, and a specialization in content-based applications. DocuLabs has established itself as a premier consultancy in the information management and information governance market, engaged by most of the Fortune 100 over its 22-year history. And we also have with us David Janess, and David is a writer and public speaker who specializes in communicating the benefits of new technologies to business decision makers. At IBM, he develops the messaging strategy for the ECM division and writes executive speeches and videos and produces IBM live events. Prior to 2010, Mr. Janess performed a similar role with the Capture Pioneer Data Cap for 12 years. So I'm going to turn things over right now to David Janess to begin our chat today. David. Thank you very much, Teresa. Well, I want to start with John Mancini, our friend from AIM, who has been keynoting the IBM Content 2017 events in North America. And somewhere in his presentation uh, in the morning, he challenges the audience to essentially treat data and content in the same way. Now, this is a profound statement because it points out the mental silos that we've created around content. And really, if we're still thinking that content is records that we scan and store away, then we should change our name to Rip Van Winkle and grow a beard. Because content is the source of all customer information and it's where the knowledge of each company is stored. So, speaking of Rip Van Winkle, Data Cab headquarters were actually a mile from Sleepy Hollow in Westchester County when I joined in 1998, and incidentally, when I met first Rich Medina. Well, 20 years ago, Capture was, for the most part, mostly scan and store. A pretty simple, take a picture of the document, get some, uh, a, a document number and some metadata and put it away. Or a number of companies were beginning to move into auto-indexing and finding ways to use barcodes and separator sheets to index and, and get document identification in an automated form. 
What DataCap and a few of the uh, other software vendors in the capture space were working on, though, the new frontier was transactional capture, the ability to find and extract data on documents for a, a business process. And we all got quite good at building templates and zone strategies that we could pair with OCR to grab data for, for tax processing or for medical claims or for invoices. The next evolution was distributed capture, which kind of morphed into multi-channel capture. And that's the idea that uh, we could put capture on smartphones and on MFPs and, and make everyone in the organization a potential point of capture. But when it comes to getting data off of documents, we're still stuck with this template and zonal type of, uh, of, of strategy. Well, in 2010, DataCap was acquired by IBM. And once you join IBM, you suddenly have access to lots of new tools and capabilities, including all the artificial intelligence underneath Watson. Well, we introduced cognitive capture a little more than a year ago, and it represents a big step forward because we are free of the template, and we can get much more data off the document. So I want to take the next 10 minutes and show you what it can do. So what is cognitive capture? Well, in the template world, you have to know the layout of the document first and then build your zones and your rules to locate data on them. Cognitive capture flips this completely around. It reads the entire document and pulls off the data and uses the text, the layout, the font size, the images, anything it can get off of it as clues to what the document is. So it ends the tyranny of the template. It helps automate classification, learning as it goes, and it enables you to kick off a workflow, open a case, assign a task, whatever you need to do based on the data that you find. Sounds like magic. And in some ways, it certainly is magical. Uh, it used this full page OCR to read all of the words on the document, or if it's a PDF and you already have the text, it feeds that in. And then it uses natural language analysis to put the text in context. So on the left, you have a block of text. Okay, so the word commander, for example, it's a military rank, it's a software product, it's a type of a Jeep, it's a movie title, it's a first part of a popular restaurant in New Orleans, it can mean a lot of things. But put it in context, if it's followed by four cubic feet, 26 cycle king size washer, well, now then we can determine that it's a washing machine and we can pull off all the issues and even get the sentiment, which is clearly articulated here in the statement, I hate this machine. So that's in a nutshell, what cognitive capture can do. Let's stick with uh, complaint letters, because I think it's a great example of the type of document that's impossible to capture with templates, but works very well with cognitive capture. So, and there's organizations all over the world that have centralized their complaint uh, letter processing, and they'll get hundreds or even thousands of these letters a day, and they've got people manually reading them and determining what to do. Well, let's see what cognitive capture would do. Real easy steps. We're going to feed a bunch of documents into a scanner, or as I say, if they're already PDFs, we put them into the capture system. Then we're going to begin to break down the structure of that document, and we're going to look for a title, or we're going to look for images, or a logo, or a signature, and we're going to Look what, at the blocks of text, and we're going to look for dates and addresses and numbers, and we're going to pull all of these things off. And we're also going to look for lines and tables and rich text where bold or italic or bigger fonts are, are trying to tell us something. All of these provide clues. Then the cognitive capture uh, uses text analytics, and there's two engines in the in the uh, DataCap Insight Edition that do a couple of different things, but together give us the, the end result we're looking for. So first, uh, we're pulling off all of the names, amounts, dates, and so forth, and we're putting them into uh, annotators. But we're also using this natural language understanding, which is a Watson product, to look for sentiment and to look for patterns and to look for key phrases and, and, and key concepts 
such as I hate this machine. When you put those together, you get a sense of the sentiment that's within the, the document. And then now, because we've seen a bunch of dispute letters, they all look, have a similar type of layout. They all start and end. They have blocks of text. They have this type of, uh, of, of data in it. They're talking about products that are in our catalog. We can say, this is a dispute letter. And once we know it's a dispute letter, now we can get to work and we can trigger stuff. We can say, well, this is the information we need for dispute letters. We can pull it off and make sure it's accurate. And then we can, even at the bottom here, we see there's a social security number in there, so we can redact that if we need to because we don't want to have that information uh, in the middle of our business process, and we can get to work. So that gives you a sense of, of how, without templates, we can gather information, classify a document, and put that information to work. Let's take a look at the same concept but a different use case. So if you're a life insurance uh, company and you sell a policy to a new customer, there's a few things that have to happen at this point. It's a complex process, but you, you need to develop a risk profile to determine what policy, what uh, the premiums might be, and so forth. And this can take a long time if you're doing this manually. But what our partner, Pyramid Solutions, did is take the, uh, the DataCap uh, Cognitive Capture Solution and build an interesting application. I'll give you a little taste of it here. So they'll feed in as many medical records as uh, they can get around this new customer, and they're going to start looking for information they need to build a profile. And, whoa, we may find a document that has a header here that says medical history. And now we can go to work extracting information. So if we take a closer look here, we have labels and we have data. And one of the cool things in the DataCap Inside Edition is a patent pending here about how to recognize labels and data and match them. And so it helps us look for information that we're going to need downstream. Now then, something the pyramid built was to take that information, apply everything it can find around dates, diagnoses, and the prescriptions, and build a timeline. And in that timeline, begin to see a pattern and some information about that customer and uh, whether they're high risk, medium risk, and so forth. And as you can see in this example, they're pretty high risk. So there's another pretty cool use of this technology. Let's take a look at trade finance. Trade finance is a kind of esoteric uh, global banking application, uh, but the key points to remember is that it's happening all over the world. Uh, so every region of the world has banks that are financing deals and financing ship shippers, importers, and exporters. It is a heavily manual process, and so you know hundreds or even thousands of, of people working on this this process in the back office. And if you can provide some extra time, if you can shave time off of the, uh, the process or shave uh, effort off of the process and make it more accurate, you can get a real competitive advantage. So this seemed to be a really good application to go after. And, uh, you know, this is an example of the kind of uh, rooms where, where manual data entry is going on. And if you can uh, trim this down, uh, this is really where capture pays for itself. This is a, a totally ROI type of, uh, of application where you can pay for, your, for, your, uh, for the software in eight to nine to ten months. It's a complicated process. The only thing I want you to see with this uh, eye chart here is that between the exporter and the importer, there's a lot of steps, there's a lot of documents, there's a lot, and many of these documents are not documents you could capture with a template. You're going to need something more robust. You're going to need this new approach. And uh, indeed, uh, a bank in Asia Pacific, one of the large uh, trade finance uh, banks there, their di division put this into uh, practice in 26, uh, 2016, deployed it, and we've already begun to see some pretty cool results here, 100% recognition rate on the trade documents. 18% uh, improvement in document handling, which means the right people are getting the right documents at the right time. It's accurate, and the process can speed up. And there's that 50% reduction in data entry personnel. There's your return on investment. So this stuff is real, 
a number of banks are moving forward with applications uh, around this, and uh, it's a pretty cool application. One more to think about, and this is an IBM customer in the Mideast, a large bank, who is using Capture to feed an analytics engine. They realize that financial documents and customer documents have a lot of information in them and that they haven't been taken advantage of. And so they're using Capture to extract information and they're putting it into a predictive analytics engine so that they can make a determination, this customer is getting ready to pull their money out of my bank and go to another bank. Can we fix it? Can we identify ahead of time a, a problem and then go to work on it? So just some more uh, use cases that we're in the middle of uh, developing some solutions, working on, or our business partners, uh, for example, in the capture for process space, Imagine Solutions has built a really cool title insurance application using this technology to automate a title plan. So different uh, back ends for, for the information that you're capturing, but here you can see there's a lot of uses for this that take us uh, into many new areas in the organization. Lastly, I would love you to have a look at it. We have a 10-minute demo on YouTube, very easy to, uh, to check it out. So uh, here's the, the link to it, and uh, I hope you'll take a look at it in action. And at this point, I am going to turn us over to our colleague today, Mr. Richard Medina. <clears throat> Thank you very much, David. Um, I, uh, I'm still bald, and, uh, but I, I have not shaved. So I actually, I'm actually probably wearing the same type of shirt. Um, <clears throat> not a lot has changed since it's taken. Um, well, the, uh, as this slide says, um, I'm going to focus on planning and rolling out the new advanced capabilities that David was talking about. And we find that organizations who are most successful in deploying new capture and processing technologies um, incrementally, uh, they incrementally introduce it into an already strong capture and document processing operation. Um, and you can do point solutions and green field solutions starting brand new, but those are special cases of the general case where you've probably been doing capture for a number of years and now you're adding on the newer technologies just as you evolved, as David talked about from uh, uh, mobile, transactional, MFP, and, and so on throughout the years. So I'm going to spend my time here explaining how to have a strong capture operation so you can introduce cognitive capture and some of the other technologies like uh, RPA, robotics, case management, and so on that are a little bit beyond the scope but are nevertheless um, uh, popular technologies today to introduce with uh, technology, with capture, rather. Uh, just a word about us, uh, management, the technology consulting firm, we don't sell software or implement uh, any of this stuff. We don't work for a living like David. Um, we're just brains on a stick. Um, we've been around since 1993 doing strategic consulting around information management. And uh, I guess this is a, the overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'll start with a few basics and then talk about program frameworks and what a strong capture app looks like. And then when you see me talking about roadmaps, you'll know that we're almost done. Okay. So first, some basics about what I'm assuming about you folks. I'm assuming that you're um, at least mid-market. Many of you are a large organization. Many of you are in financial services or insurance, but you're from other organizations as well, other verticals like government, manufacturing. Uh, I'm assuming that you can do capture as an enterprise shared service or hire someone to do it for you, a BPO, a service provider, or maybe you're just doing it at a unit level or a point project. So you might be doing capture for an internal administrative function like accounts payable or contact center, um, or maybe a line of business function like underwriting or new accounts opening or some of the other financial services and insurance functions. And the reasons that you do capture, you want to do capture better is you know, this laundry list on the right-hand side, to reduce the inefficiencies of paper and documents versus data, uh, to reduce the inefficiencies of manual processes and inefficient, expensive workflow, to improve your process control and quality, or to reduce your regulatory risk and improve visibility into your processes. 
Okay, that's basic background. Now, here's some geeky stuff. Um, as the cliche goes, you can't uh, manage what you can't measure. So my first suggestion to you is to try to get a handle on the cost of your document and data processes um, for ingestion, for capture. And I'll explain more about how we got this data, but this comes from our benchmarking of capture options over the last 20 years or so. <clears throat> this is real data from real organizations, from many of your peers. Um, but take a look at this. Um, so these costs come from in-house and BPO or for-profit operations, and we break the cost in services or activities like sort and prep, scanning, data entry, exception handling, research, and automated recognition, some of the fancier stuff that David was talking about. Then we break it into tiers from simple to complex and so on. And we look at, oh, an example, in-house operation, which is pro may well be like your own. It's kind of in the middle of the pack. Um, the industry as a whole, we look at for profits and in-house operations for each. So you might compare yourselves with these costs and just contact me if you want me to if you want help in getting started with this kind of estimate and a starter spreadsheet and so on to save you some labor of your own. Um, but note the automation at the bottom. Automation is cheap because there's very low labor cost. It still has some labor because there's Q, uh, uh, quality control and error detection and correction and so on. But one of the most important self-measurements that you folks should conduct pretty soon is determining how much and which document types and processes are amenable to recognition and automation. Versus, you know, a year ago I would have said versus crazy handprint or correspondence, but <clears throat> there have been some great advances in handprint recognition and uh, correspondence processing and so on. So that's amenable as well. Um, and then even as those uh, document types and, and uh, characteristics are becoming more amenable, as David explained, you can do a lot more with those documents once they're digitized. The basic idea is how you're pushing with capture operations, you're pushing um, downstream. And so you're taking into what traditionally was done with capture, what traditionally was done in the line of business downstream by more expensive people and so on, um, you're taking that on and off and so on, being more efficient, being able to do more in less time, and so on. But my basic point here is that a first good step right now is to see if you can get some type of estimate of what you're spending or messing around with with your ingestion and processing activities. And then, in addition to that, or instead of that, if you really can't get a quantitative notion, is to try to get a qualitative picture of your ingestion activities. Most organizations this mess. Um, they're taking in documents and data from multiple locations and multiple technology channels, such as paper and MFPs and email and fax and smartphones and portal upload. And they've literally been doing this since the late 1990s. But with many of them, it's like this mess with no unified approach, no so-called hub and spoke design, which I'll explain in a bit, no platform consolidation. And that's just half of the problem because not only are, is it, it's also a problem doing exception handling. Those are the red lines there. So in each of those areas, you have to go back, and if there are problems arise or some documents require special handling or whatever, you have additional lines. And the problem with this kind of arrangement today is that <clears throat> um, it, it's not only disorganized, but it's also too late and too damaging and too expensive. Mistakes don't get addressed until they are far downstream meaning lost time, unhappy customers, and inefficiency. So that's the problem that most organizations like yourselves doing capture must solve, the inefficiency of multiple channels, work streams, and services. And on top of that, you may be considering introducing new technologies or automation like the ones David described. So it really behooves us to take a look at how to set ourselves up right to have a strong capture operation. And so I'm going to do that right now. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to talk about uh, methods for a good program framework, best practices for operating your capture initiatives, and using an effective roadmap as you folks move forward. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, fr program framework first. You probably know that to do anything more than the simplest point solutions requires a lot of activities. It's useful to organize them into kind of a glorified checklist or program framework. 
The framework shows the individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions for initiative success along with the dependencies and so on. And with tweaks, this kind of framework, the six box framework, um, can be used not just for only for capture and automation, but management, for broader information governance, for all related type programs that you might be interested in. And we found it most useful to bucket these areas of competency into six general categories. And these are first, as you see, the overall program strategy, which is your overall plan, your current state, future state, and roadmap to get there. The most mature organizations that we've assessed have developed and implemented a strategy and roadmap for most areas around information management, including capture and automation, but also ECM, records management, even parts of data management at the enterprise level. The second piece is what we call governance team and operations. So this is the governance team structure and operational roles and responsibilities. Um, one of the things that you'll find is that as you move into the newfangled technologies, you'll need additional roles and responsibilities to address them. For example, as you move into cognitive capture, autom uh, artificial intelligence, and so on, you will need some additional expertise, which you either buy or you rent. Um, Next is process design and implementation. So these are the processes for doing this stuff right, but also the rules, the policies and procedures, and so on. And you'll find that the two biggest challenges today for capture process design are typically implementing this hub and spoke model that I keep hinting at, and also taking on downstream workflows. That is taking on the not in good order processing or some of the, or processing some of the complaint letters that, that David was talking about, and so on incorporated them into the capture operation. Next is information architecture. So this is how you organize your, your forms and your files and do a taxonomy and determine what metadata should be tagged on the documents and so on. And the best practice here is to start with your um, plan from wherever you are to a mostly digital type of situation where you're always thinking about round trip documents, documents that you actually are in your control, say forms for new accounts or for underwriting that then go out to the customer and get filled out in some way and then come back to you. And to be able to make that as efficient as possible is, should be one of your key design um, objectives. Just two more. The uh, next one is architecture and technology. And for <clears throat> enterprise capture and automation, the best practice here is to standardize on a single vendor like IBM for hub and spoke and then incrementally introduce uh, new technologies like case management and cognitive capture and robotics and so on to replace labor and expensive process management tools. And then finally, communications and training, but I won't belabor that. That's kind of obvious that you have to do communication and training. So now that I've um, I just done a whirlwind tour of uh, the program frameworks for how to plan and manage your capture initiatives so that they're successful and so you can incorporate the new capabilities. Now I want to talk more specifically about what strong capture operations do day to day. What do they look like? What's the day in the life of a capture operation that's strong? What does it look like? I'm going to talk about the results of some of the benchmarking that we've done for in-house and for-profit operations since 1993. And we continuously update the evaluations so the bar keeps getting raised. The organizations we evaluate are mostly large financial services and insurance companies, and they are skewed to be high performers. They assess themselves, they're trying to get better, and so on. Um, so the, the curve, the class curve is kind of messed up. It's pretty uh, high performing. But even if you are mid-sized or just doing a single capture project, uh, this would be helpful as a glorified checklist. Now, we evaluate 11 criteria, starting with the obvious. Think of it as starting from the, the center and then moving out. So we start with the obvious core factors relevant to ingestion and then move out the factors that are less obvious but still necessary. We start by focusing on the core capture processes and technologies, like what capture software is used, what indexing, what automation, um, RPA, uh, uh, BPM and RPA technologies used. And then moved out to operations like measuring staff productivity and human resources like measuring staff turnover and cross-training. And then financial management like measure, measuring captured job costing like that spreadsheet I just showed you and several other factors. 
Well, here's the, I show you right here the, the complete list of criteria, but don't worry, I'm going to combine and skim over some of them and just give you the highlights that are relevant for uh, what we're talking about right now. So the first one is about what we call primary processes. And so to efficiently do the capture work you're already doing, let alone get new customers and offer new services and successfully in implement technolo new technology like cognitive capture, there's both the basic blocking and tackling, but then some finesse stuff you got to do. And by the way, when I say customers, it's capture services. For most of you, these guys are going to be internal customers, you know, the business units, unless you're a BPO, a service provider. Now, the blocking and tackling is that you do process design proactively, of course, and you try to move your customers into your kind of productized service offering. So it's, you're not doing – everyone is not – you're almost doing cookie cutter. It's not, um, you're not doing um, handcrafting every single work stream that, that comes along. Um, so you're doing things like tiers, but also other services like repository management and, and some of the um, not in good order processing and some of the stuff that David was talking about. And you should be actively moving them in the direction of born digital stays digital, away from paper, but also away from bad digital channels like fax into good ones like e-forms and portal upload and email. And this means, and David agrees, that if it's born as data, don't convert it to even an electronic doc unless you have to, for example, for record keeping or other purposes. And as I indicated before, both you and your customers should have a round trip focus. That is, any documents that go, from, uh, that go to your customer and then get filled out and then return to your customer uh, should be designed for high digital automation efficiency. You should be focusing on e-forms and e-sign and some of these other, um, uh, and data, portal upload, and so on. Next, I'm going to talk about, very briefly, about <clears throat> what we call supporting processes. So these are items, I'll be very brief about it, the peripheral processes that support capture. So they include helper processes like real-time reporting of where the work is in the, in the, uh, in the workflow, and smart routing and workload balancing. Um, so you can route stuff around throughout the day and throughout the week and such. Um, but they're also about expanding the scope of capture to encompass traditional downstream processes like, I've, I've used this term before, NIGO processing. Um, that's determining if you get a, like a, a, a package of document, you know, a document or a package of documents, you look to see, you vet it. You look to see if it's complete and it's correct. And if it's not, then you immediately try to get it fixed. <clears throat> And then um, the next two areas, which I'm going to put together, are uh, the primary and supporting technology capabilities. So these are kind of the fun ones. These are um, <clears throat> the, uh, the old, something, something old and something new, it's like the, the technologies that David was talking about. But what I want to talk about here is that you should be thinking about a hub-and-spoke design. And um, what that means, finally I'm going to explain it, is that you can take in all paper and electronic channels, all documents and data, but then merge them for efficient processing. Uh, you treat each one the same. If they should be treated the same, you treat them differently. If they should be treated differently. And if they need auto, for example, auto recognition and extraction and Q, QC and routing and release, you use a, a centralized area to do that. And so this means that you likely need a platform that can do at least most of your activities rather than try to cobble together a Frankenstein monster. Um, and so something like, uh, well, like uh, IBM DataCap, uh, which can do many of these things that, that we're talking about now. Um, and the hot areas that your customers may be thinking about today are cognitive capture, as David indicated, but also case management and robots. Um, robotic processing automation. The key is to introduce these the way you, in, you introduce character recognition and document identification that is incrementally step-by-step, step, building on your strong operations. And the traditional recognition technologies are hard-spoken and ready to roll, but many areas of cognitive capture and robots are still very new. They can provide you with great benefit, but no one has had them in place for more than a few years or so. Um, so ask me about them if you want, ask David, uh, but it's, uh, uh, get some help on some of these. So now we're going to talk about operations. So we're going out of the core of processes and technology and talking about things like service level conformance and so on. With operations, you are looking at service level agreement conformance, the utilization of your equipment and your employee productivity. You should be proactively monitoring your daily work volume so you can address spikes with flexibility. So the best in class 
You use temps and contract labor to address spikes. You build to the average. You don't build to the seasonal spikes or whatever. And you supplement with outsource, with contract or temp folks. One of the areas, and I like this one, is quality mechanisms. The reason I like it is that it's an, a good poster child for one thing that we've learned. So one thing that we've learned is when you scale up your capture operation by adding new customers, streams, or new services, or new technologies, you can't just scale up quantitatively by adding more bodies to a manual process. You have to do things qualitatively differently. And one example of this is how you do quality control, quality um, assurance. You can't check every image and every character. You have to do some smart sampling. So you need to automate the ways to help you do that and business rules for when you need to check everything versus relax a little versus relax a lot. And there are many standards out there. One of them is the so-called military tables, which sounds pretty cool, but it's just a, it's a spreadsheet of percentages and so on. Rules, business rules that say, when you can, you know, if you see no mistakes, then you can become more relaxed. If there are some this certain percentage of mistakes, then you have to get more rigorous until you no longer see these kinds of mistakes for a certain amount of time, blah, blah, blah. It's very useful. You can pull it off of the web, just do a Google search, um, or just ask me and I'll email it to you. Um, but note also that your notion of quality should reach farther downstream. So leading organizations track not just the errors that get detected and corrected within the capture operation, but also so-called incidents. That is the errors that escape detection and correction and start doing damage downstream. And you want to get those, um, you know, obviously minimize those as much as possible. And then now I'm going to talk about human resources, as it, so the people. And in the best capture operations, we find that uh, for successfully implementing new customers, new services, and new technologies, it's best to cross-train your staff so you can address peaks in the flow, and this applies to temps as well. And often, if you can swing it, it's often useful to use what are called piece rate incentives. So workers get bonuses based on volume and quality levels. And then we've seen good success with workers owning a work stream from the time it hits the door until it gets released downstream. Um, and, and finally, we've seen great success if your workers can spend a day in the life of their downstream customers, and your customers can spend a day in the, uh, you know, a day in the capture operation and so on. With the best organizations, what often happens is poaching. That is a downstream organization underwriting or new account opening or whatever um, will say, yeah, we, and poach and hire the person from the capture center. And that works out really well. Um, actually, because now you've got an ally, someone who understands capture in the downstream area. And we're expanding, we're going out even further to customer satisfaction. Uh, customer satisfaction is another area where you've got to be more proactive and strategic. Do things differently than if you're just doing a few number of work streams using older technologies. Um, as you roll out new customer services and technologies, you've got to have your hand on the pulse of your customers and be proactive, nudging them to new services and technologies. Um, of course, be proactive. But what I mean substantively is use something like Net Promoter um, so you can see their level of satisfaction, but also question them. Do some detailed surveys about their particular needs, wants, and problems so you can address them with uh, new consulting uh, and new services. And then here's my favorite, which is what I kind of started out with when I showed you that uh, spreadsheet, and that is financial management. And um, <clears throat> to run your operation well and to plan and manage for new customer services and automation technology, you've got to have a handle on this. It means tracking your costs by application and pricing them variably. Um, it also means creating tiers or levels of services like basic, standard, and enhanced, and pricing accordingly. Pricing not just if you're a BPO, but also or if you're doing chargeback, but also so that you understand what your costs are. Um, even if you're an in-house operation, uh, considering out um, and possibly considering outsourcing, you tracking your costs like you're going to be charging back. Uh, to your internal customers. And if you do this, you can see which processes and activities are expensive and can justify automation, or where, for example, things are, seem to be mysteriously cheap. And the reason for being mysteriously cheap is that you're actually tossing the hot potato downstream where more expensive resources, say in 
again, claims processing or um, underwriting or new account opening are actually doing the work. So if you can take that work on, being using efficient cognitive capture and so on, RPAs and such, um, you know, you can save your downstream customers a lot of time and effort and they can use their labor for the reason they got hired, to do some of that adjudication, uh, decision-making, and so on, rather than um, cranking around documents. Now, one caveat is one of the lessons of the new automation technology like robots and AI and so on is that you sure can start uh, looking at reducing your headcount, your FTE or full-time equivalent headcount with labor reductions, but that's not the only thing you should be looking at. Many of the new automation technologies don't reduce headcount so much as reduce the time and effort for routine tasks of a large number of people. Or with some of the AI stuff that David was talking about, it's not so much routine tasks, uh, but it's actually pretty sophisticated decision, eh, somewhat complex decision making. The contact center and correspondence complaint letter are, are uh, one example of that. So you may not be eliminating headcount, but rather helping people do their jobs. And the next piece is, we just got two more on these. I'm just going to go over them briefly with vendor management. Um, <clears throat> I'll just um, reiterate with vendor management that you should be consolidating where it makes sense for a so-called hub and spoke configuration. And you also should be very active in joining user groups with your peers. So if you folks are in manufacturing or in insurance or financial services, join birds of a feather group and make demands of your vendors like IBM as a unified block rather than as lone voices crying in the wilderness. And then finally, last one, I'm going to talk about business continuity. This is usually a boring category for me, but actually it gets a little more exciting as you use the new technologies because it gets more complex, unfortunately. Um, so you need plans to uh, Get paper to the backup scan sites if something happens to your primary scan site, so by truck or whatever it is. But now as you use more automation technologies and so on, you'll need plans for all the different channels, including mobile and portal upload. And then you'll always have to have plans for the new cognitive capture and artificial intelligence and robotics um, technologies, tools, to address what will happen when they don't work. What do you do? How to back up? You can always go from electronic image to paper, right, in the event of a disaster, but what do you do if um, you lose the skill to make simple decisions about your, uh, of the documents that come in? Okay, so <clears throat> I, talked about, um, I talked about frameworks and I talked about uh, uh, how to get a strong day-to-day, how to, that you should introduce the new technologies into an already strong capture operation and what strong capture operations actually look like today on a day-to-day -day basis. And now I'm just going to say a couple words about um, how to get from where you are today or where you want to be, say, in 18 months, three years, five years, and so on. And this is your roadmap. And in your roadmap, we find it most effective to have three types of initiatives. We call them program technology and business process or migration uh, where program are those that improve your organizational discipline for managing processes and your ability to, to implement governance. So these are the non-technology things you have to do, like operations and HR and financial management. Then technology in initiatives, which are to select and stand up the technologies, whether it is co uh, cognitive capture or your scanners or your buckets, your ECM repositories, and so on. And then the business process initiatives are those that hook up uh, the various your your customers um, and where you pr actually provide them with the capture automation and ECM services. And what you see is uh, we strongly recommend that you consider, you know, bucketing your initiatives into those uh, types of uh, categories. And what your roadmap will look like is something like this, um, which has all three. I won't go into detail on it. If you want examples of, of roadmaps to get you started, um, I can certainly send you one and walk you through them and so on. And I believe that's it. So I'm going to hand it back to uh, Teresa. Sure thing. Thank you. And we've been listening to Richard Medina of DocuLabs, and before that was David Janess of IBM. Thank you. And we do have a number of questions that have come in, and I'm uh, just going to do my best to get to as many of these as we can right now. And so... Um, um, David, uh, back when you were speaking, someone was asking about 
um, f for the, the document types. You focus your example on like, complaint letters. Um, someone's asking about would educational documents like transcripts work well for cognitive capture. What, what other types of, of, of document areas could this work really well? Could cognitive capture work well with? Well, you know, what? It's, it's almost like I want to flip my answer. It, it, the ones that traditional capture work well on are structured and you know you can predict where information is going to be. A 1040 tax return, you always know where the name is, where the social security number goes, and that's easy to predict and go get. But when you get it to free form documents, and I show correspondence, which is about as free form as you can get, and contracts, now you're into a whole other area. So transcripts, to me, from what uh, I recall and uh, having seen them, do seem like a very good uh, candidate for this. We have had some business partners attack transcripts uh, previously with, with traditional approaches and have some success. So I would imagine we could see incremental uh, success, although I haven't heard of a, of a project uh, when I did my asking around uh, in preparation for this on, on transcripts per se. Okay, thank you. And um, Rich, even though we were half joking about it in group chat about robots coming down the line, um, robotic technology is very valuable um, in information management. Um, Want to hear your thoughts on that? Yeah. So hey, I didn't I didn't uh, invent the term. I don't like it. Um, it's much <laughs> less glamorous than it sounds. There, you know, it's uh, so it's called RPA, robotic process automation. You know what a process is, it's a sequence of steps, and you know what automation is. The robotic part is uh, these things, these tools um, basically mimic what humans would do uh, as, they're, as they're pointing and clicking and doing various tasks and so on. So most of the, most of the stuff that they can do is uh, repetitious, rule-based, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so it is like uh, macros on steroids, but it actually is uh, it's not as fragile as uh, macros, and there's a lot more smarts into it than that, but it's certainly not like AI. Um, so there is a kind of a, a pretty well-defined domain for this uh, robotic RPA or whatever. And they're good, again, if you have uh, repetitive tasks um, that are rules-based um, that uh, typically so far have resisted automation. And most, most of the time, many times they're just not cost-effective. Because they might not, there might just be single tasks within a broader workflow, and you don't want to spin up a, a workflow in order to address a single task, even if like a thousand people are doing it. Typically, you spin up workflow to do an entire process and so on. So I'm as skeptical as you guys are out there, maybe more so because I've seen the burn victims, but uh, uh, there is a definite use for it. And it's been around for several years now, and there are some uh, very good vendors and so on who are able to do it. Anyway, so that's robotic processing. They definitely have a place. Hey, I can, I can add a thought or two on that. We we've seen sure. data cap attached to robotics processing automation in the manufacturing or chemicals industry around an accounts payable application. And one of the benefits, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rich, but one of the benefits is is that a business user can can help uh, train these robots to do some of the stuff that they would do previously. Whereas, as you pointed out, with a hard-coded workflow, that, you know, you're going to need IT to come in and, 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 and build, build those workflows for you. So that there's a little bit extra uh, fluctuation. But the, uh, but the repetitive, you know, if you think about accounts payable, okay, I've got an invoice. I don't have a PO, though, uh, but I have a proof of delivery. I better uh, send this off to the department head for approval before I pay it. So that could be something a robot would, would easily uh, be able to, to, to accomplish for you. And now you've taken that off the hands of a, of a human being. Yeah, I agree completely. <clears throat> Definitely provides, puts more power into the hands of the business owners, takes it off the, takes it off of the stack of IT and so on. You just have to be, just, here's, here's a comment where we can take our learnings, what we know now about captions on and apply it to this other area. Um, you can't scale in a quantitative manner. So the first ones that you, the first projects you do are going to be singular and kind of ad hoc and a little bit here and a little bit there. But then if you move from 10 robots to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000, you're dead if you try to scale it that way. You've got to then have an enterprise approach and so on. So many of the same themes I was talking about as you scale up your capture operation are applicable for robotics. Um, 
I have another question that's come in here, and David, I want to direct this towards you. Someone's asking about, um, you know, does your product do the automated classification of traditional unstructured documents within file shares? Well, within file shares, we can just lop that off the sentence. I mean, the idea is you want to bring it into the capture system wherever it happens to be. If it's in box or if it's in a file share or if it's in an ECM repository, bring it into the capture system and then yes. Now, this over the years, I mean, if you go back to my little history lesson at the beginning, classification and document identification were absolutely essential from the very beginning. And these separator sheets and barcodes and all these are strategies to classify a document. Uh, and, and over the years, DataCap has developed uh, its additional classification strategies, and our business partners have come up with interesting uh, improvements and in, uh, in their own solutions that run on top of DataCap, depending on an industry, for example. So the answer is yes, there's a lot of classification techniques. What I was trying to convey is that we've flipped the model, though, to, uh, to be able to classify based on the information that's on the document and we're, we're seeing a lot of success there. And that gets to the machine learning piece of uh, artificial intelligence. So as you get more and more of these documents, and as maybe the first couple aren't quite as accurate as you want, you correct it. So it's supervised machine learning, but it doesn't make the same mistake twice. And it becomes much more adept at it. So yes, inside the data cap inside edition can be used for automated classification. There's also a number of other pieces in DataCap itself that also classify. And you could set up something where if the first method doesn't work and the second method doesn't work, then you go to the cognitive method. You could you could build it that way as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I know some more questions are coming in. I just want to take a brief moment just to mention a couple of other things here. Um, AIM has a new ebook out, and it's um, authored by um, AIM Chief Evangelist John Mancini. And it's uh, What's moving, what's beyond ECM? We're talking about you know, the, the advancements of so many different technology types um, and just the industry in general. And uh, this is John's assessment of what's coming next with, with ECM and, and dubbing it Intelligent Information Management. I encourage you to download this paper. That's at um, aim.org slash IIM, Intelligent Information Management. Um, and, and there's a lot of really good insights in here. And um, there's going to be more coming up from AIM on, on this topic throughout the year. So just uh, wanted to invite you to come in and, and download that paper and just read a little bit about it. And then also wanted to mention AIM's training. Um, as, as you may know, may not know, AIM offers a wide variety of training um, for you, whether it's online, in, in person, instructor-led, um, uh, custom training for your organization where we come into into um, your office space and just bring just your staff. So there, there's a wide variety of different ways that we can help you learn and, and grow to be able to tackle these business challenges. And it's also on a, a wide variety of topic areas, um, covering ECM information management in general, um, getting to very specific topics with uh, uh, records management, uh, process improvement. So there's a lot of information on our website and a lot of different ways to slice and dice how to tackle this learning. So I encourage you to check that out at aim.org slash training. So I just wanted to mention that because um, I realize we're getting close to the end of the webinar hour. Um, now let me come back here and just take, I think we can squeeze in an, another question in here. And um, Rich, let me start with you with this, and, and David, feel free to, to join in. And, so, Rich, someone's asking, what kinds of um, additional roles and responsibilities do you see um, that people and organizations will need as we move from traditional capture to cognitive capture? I have to say I'm not hearing Rich. So are you? Oh, okay. I, I wasn't sure oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was babbling, babbling away. <laughs> I was on mute. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. I, I apologize. Anyway, so very quickly, uh, since I already did the, uh, the the dress rehearsal, my response, I can now do it very well, succinctly. Um, so we're seeing that on the technical side. So both for on the for business and for technology, being able to handle um, whether the new cognitive capture. Uh, case management, 
yeah, robotics, AI, and so on. It's being able to have uh, the skills, say, on uh, uh, the business side, process analysis, and so on, to be able to handle some of those more complex tasks and uh, 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 complex processes to know where um, – <clears throat> where um, the business processes could use some of this new technology. And then on the technology side, being able to tune it and so on, and being able to offer and say, oh, yeah, a robot would fit there, or oh, yeah, um, text analysis would work there, and so on. So just as, you know, 15 years ago, we saw that organizations, as they moved into um, document recognition and data rec and rec uh, forms recognition and so on, they needed skills to be able to tune that stuff. It wasn't just dumb capture. Uh, likewise, you need to ramp up on this stuff as well. Okay. Um, another question I want to squeeze in here real quickly. Um, David, someone's asking how many languages um, does your product support? Very good. Uh, and it's a good question because early on when Watson was first introduced, and, and Watson is the engine underneath uh, a lot of this that I've been talking about, it was English only. Uh, we're up to at least 35 languages that I've heard, some of them quite esoteric. I didn't realize there were two Norwegian languages that you'd have to support if you were going to support Norwegian. Uh, so uh, it, it's a uh, pretty pretty long list now. So uh, you can apply these around the world in different languages. Uh, the example that I gave of the, uh, of the bank in Asia Pacific is indeed working through several languages uh, because their importers and exporters are uh, in many different countries. Great, thank you. Um, we are just about at the end of our webinar hour, and just want to remind everyone that we have been recording things, and it will be available in a day or two. And we, we do email everyone just to let you know when the replay is available. So we encourage you to listen to it again. Invite others to listen to it. Don't forget to download the resources uh, that are available to you um, in that area off to the, the slides. And also to take the survey when the webinar is over with. Let us know how we did and offer that feedback. Very much want to thank our underwriter, IBM. Without the support of our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs. So uh, thank you, IBM, for your sponsorship. And as we do come to a close here, I just want to ask each of our speakers for their closing thoughts or a key takeaway from everything that we discussed today. So I'm going to begin first with Richard Medina of DocuLabs. Your closing thoughts today. Yeah, just really simply. So we've learned we're trainable here. So. Uh, just as we saw with the, the advent of MFPs, multifunction devices, in 2003, and then with uh, multi-channel, particularly mobile smartphones in 2010 or so, and then with uh, the advance of uh, do, being able to take on uh, downstream automation and take that on with uh, the NIGO processing and some of the other complex processes, um, the, the words of wisdom I would give is, yeah, sure, do some pilots, get your hands wet, your feet wet, and so on doing it but also focus particularly on the center. So these, these areas uh, have to do with like the periphery, like MFPs and smartphones and so on, uh, radically distributed um, input side, the upstream side, and distributed um, uh, downstream, say, NIGO processing, get, doing stuff that the business units typically do that's uh, more complex downstream stuff. So you might think that you really got to focus on upstream and downstream, but actually the lessons we've learned is get your house in order with centralized capture, the way you're doing stuff, and so on. And I hope I, I hope I gave some tips on how to do that. Thank you, Richard. And David Janess of IBM, your closing thoughts today. Well, I got some great uh, tips from you, Rich, and thank you very much for uh, <laughs> participating in this. I've always learned a lot from you. My last comment That's has what? to do with something we've – we have all heard over the years, everybody at AIM can attest to this, is we've heard this number that there's 80% of all data in an organization is unstructured. Now, I never saw the original study, which I think was uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, but nobody disputes this estimation. And everybody also agrees that, that this unstructured data is very important. It's customer data, it's company knowledge, it's winning sales narratives, it's conversations between subject matter experts. But the difficulty of getting a hold of it, of accessing it, has made it unavailable for analytics, for understanding, and, and to take action on it. So I think we're actually at the threshold of a pretty cool moment in time where artificial intelligence has the potential to crack open stuff and get access to data that's inside of content. So I think uh, I'm, I'm seeing the beginning of it here with cognitive capture, and I believe that we will be able to meet John Mancini's challenge 
to treat content and data in the same way. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. This is Teresa Resick from AIM, and we will see you at our next webinar. And have a great afternoon.